warm welcome, especially to our invited guest speaker today, Dr. Navina Haider from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And we have been awaiting Dr. Haider's visit with great excitement and are extremely grateful that she could make this trip to San Francisco to grace Saatchi's 25th anniversary occasion. So it means so much to us. Thank you indeed. But before we move into our agenda for today, first a few remarks from Dr. Jay Shu, director of the Asian Art Museum. Good afternoon. It's a, such a wonderful occasion. And uh, so rare, if not starting to feel less rare, that we can actually get together in person. It's such a normal in life but we can never take anything for granted. Such a moment to get together, to treasure our togetherness. So actually, uh, for this great moment of uh, celebration, I'd like to begin by really honor our dearest friend, Raj Desai, who has left us, but whose memory will stay with us forever. And I think one of the great part of American life is that we try to celebrate rather than simply mourn. Of course we mourn, but I think celebrating achievements, the old friendship, the wonderful accomplishment Raj and his family has accomplished is something truly worthy. And I think their effort is reflective on the larger contribution that Saatchi has been made in the Bay Area. So 25 years is a major milestone in anyone's life or any institution's life. But I believe that Saatchi is more than an institution. I think ever since it uh, was founded 25 years ago, it had collaborated closely with the Asian Museum, helped to enlarge our horizon. But also it has collaborated with many other organizations across the Bay Area and beyond, but more so than collaborating with individual institutions, it actually creates a platform, a family, if you will, by bringing those institutions together, by cross-breeding the intellectual pursuits, the common interest in the cultural and artistic heritage of the Indian subcontinent and beyond through cultural connections and artistic connections. That's why I say it is more than an institution. Without Saatchi, we would have so much less in our Bay Area, in this vital area of cultural interest and artistic accomplishments. So thank you, Saatchi, on behalf of the Asia Museum, and I think I can say on behalf of the, all the fellow institutions in the Bay Area and beyond, and also to bring individuals together because no platform can be successful with the wonderful performers on top of it, whether it's scholars or whether it's artists, artists mean visual artists or musicians or dancers of any type, and or collectors, and so on and so forth. So these individuals made it such what it is. So speaking of individuals, I first, I feel my wife and I were very lucky that we joined the Saatchi from the get-go I've been here for nearly 15 years, but joining Saatchi is such a sweet thing. We not only got to attend events in the South Bay, in the peninsula, but also in the Asian Art Museum. And more recently, we even be able to cancel the physical distance. The most recent event I attended was, I was at Prague. So the Zoom did enable us to cancel the physical distance Unfortunately, cannot cancel the time differences. Maybe someday we can have our avatars being able to transcend that as well. So it enabled us to learn so much. I benefited so much from learning. I'm sure that I will do so this time today with our lecture and our distinguished speaker as well. But more than learning is a friendship. It's the bond, emotional, intellectual individual institutional bond that we've been able to harvest together. That will transcend time and space. So such in this regard is a wonderful tradition. 
a tradition that 25 years young and many, many decades to come. And again, speak about individuals, I must, I think I can all, I can say that we all agree. We owe it to not only all of us, all of you in the audience, but particularly to the leaders of this Archie, from the founders to every president to our most recent tirelessly ever so energetic leader, Kapana, and the co cohorts. So let me propose a round of applause for them. Yeah. And once again, I think this moment is so symbolic because I believe today's talk has something to do with light. Light is what gives life. Light inspires us. The light brings us together and makes this life worthy. So uh, thank you for allowing me to say a few words. I th don't think you come here only to hear me. <laughs> At least of it. So have a good afternoon and enjoy the talk. Thank you and congratulations, Sachi. Okay, thank you, Jay, for those very generous remarks. And we have to find a seat for Jay. <laughs> okay, look at how wonderful, what a wonderful round of uh, audience we have over here. And after the pandemic, this seems like just such a, such a gift. So thank you, thank you all. And Jay, you just hit it right on the, right on the head. It is all about friendships. It's all, we are so small and so intimate that it's only connections and connections with individuals, connections with organizations, connections with other institutions and connections with India. So all of this comes together and in, 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 you know, in the small ways that we can bring it here. So we are just absolutely delighted and overjoyed and very proud to have all of you here. Thank you for this enthusiastic response. And, um, you know, Saatchi has enjoyed the privilege of a very long and a very generous association with the Asian Art Museum. You know, the Asian Art Museum is our single largest platform for in innumerable Saatchi events in the Bay Area. Yes, we are in the peninsula, we are in East Bay, we are in South Bay, um, but this has been one of our anchors for, for sure. And um, so now turning to our event today, we know we are in for an exceptional treat with our guest speaker on a subject that has generated much excitement for our audiences. It is all here, you can see there is no space and uh, we have a full house, so thank you, Navina. And before we ask Dr. Forrest McGill to introduce her formally, we have a few thank yous. Today's lecture program is sponsored by generous support, uh, by generous sponsors, and to each of you, our immense appreciation. We couldn't possibly do this without you. They include Sheila and Ketan Kotari, Manish Kotari and Carmen Sora, Anjali Joshi and Sanjay Kasturya, Gursharan and Elvira Sidhu, who couldn't be here, and neither could Sheila and Ketan Kotari. They are all out of town, Meryl Randall and Stephen Shervin, and Geeta and Ashok Vaish, each a long time and very dedicated friends of Saatchi's. Our reception for the afternoon, reception host for the afternoon is Motwani Jadeja family. A reception follows the event and all are invited to join. I would now like to invite our senior Watis curator of South and Southeast Asian art and a very dear Saatchi friend, Dr. Forrest McGill, to introduce the speaker and also say a few words about the launch of the Beyond Bollywood exhibition. This audience would love to hear from you. And it launches here, the exhibition launches here in spring 2023, March 31st, so have that date on your calendar. Forrest? Carlman, thank you very much. Um, happy 25th uh, birthday to, um, to Sachi. And uh, I want to join in thanking the founders and the board, present and past board members. And I just, from my own heart, I just have to say 
uh, Kalpana really has been the guiding star. There was a um, there was an email the other day calling Kalpana the guiding star of Sachi, and uh, I I know um, I know personally that that's uh, true. So Kalpana, thank you very much, and all of Sachi, thank you and congratulations. Um, I. <clears throat> just returned from Cincinnati where the um, Beyond Bollywood exhibition uh, opened on Fri just this past Friday. Um, it looks splendid, I must say. There's, uh, there's artworks from 2,000 years from India and Pakistan and various parts of Southeast Asia and the Himalayas. And uh, they're borrowed from about 25 institutions and private collections around the United States. And uh, I was, I have to tell you, I was so excited last week to see the show uh, installed and the, the artworks look great and the installation looks great and I can't wait for it now to uh, get to us in the end of March of next year. So, um, so please n n come back and be ready and be thinking about dance in the visual arts, that's the key. Dance in religion, in mythology, in court life, and in uh, daily life as we see it in the visual arts. <clears throat> now to um, turn to our speaker today, my great honor to introduce Navina Haidar. She's the Nasser Sabah Al Sabah, uh, uh, sorry, Nasser Sabah Al Ahmad Al Sabah curator in charge of the Department of Islamic Art at the Met. <clears throat> and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, Navina went to college in uh, India and then did her PhD at Oxford. And <clears throat> I won't go through her many publications and her many exhibitions because they, some of them were listed in the, um, in the invitation, so I won't go through them. But they're an amazingly... Uh, a distinguished uh, list of, of exhibitions and publications and other uh, accomplishments. The <clears throat> Navina was part of the um, the leadership group of the team that transformed the uh, Islamic galleries at the Met in f that reopened in 2011. S many of you, I think, have seen it. Um, amazing, um, really uh, changed how all of us think about Islamic art and the pres presentation of Islamic art in museums. And what I hadn't known until recently is that um, just in the last few years, there's been an effort going on to, um, again, rethink and refresh and, uh, to some extent, reconceptualize those galleries. And that was going on last year and this year. And if you're interested, and I really urge you to do this, um, just a month ago, uh, Navina gave a lecture at Cornell um, that uh, is about the history of the Islamic collections at the Met, the 2011 transformation and the new transformation, the new thinking that has been going on just in the last couple of years. And that lecture was beautifully recorded and it's on YouTube. You can find it. So if you, um, if you, uh, go to YouTube and look for Navina's name and Cornell University, you'll find the lecture that she gave just almost exactly a month ago. And it's fascinating. Uh, so I urge you to, um, to, to do that. You'll, um, you'll enjoy it very, very much. My mind was exploding with new ideas and uh, <laughs> um, really amazing. Um, the... Um, <clears throat> The uh, something that Navina emphasizes in those uh, the the 2011 and the more recent um, ga uh, gallery re uh, refresh at the Met is diversity and interconnection. Very important. And these two things, diversity and interconnection, are ones that Saatchi stands for and the Asian Art Museum stands for. So uh, we share these this. Uh, devotion to the idea of diversity and of interconnection. The um, Navina's talk today is related to a, a book that she has completed that will be coming out in the spring of 2023. 
and we should all be looking forward to it. You can find little, uh, little previews of it online if you search. Um, it has the title, Jolly Lattice of Divine Light. Jay mentioned the importance of light, and that's, we'll be hearing more about that today. Jolly Lattice of Divine Light in Mughal Architecture. And uh, the lecture today relates to the book. I wanted to read to you just one sentence to finish up. I wanted to read you one sentence from um, the book that's not out yet, but I was able to find a little bit. Um, a very uh, a, a sentence that will um, be a little a little uh, teaser for what we're about to hear. This is I'm quoting Navina. In Mughal tombs, mosques, and palaces, Jali's mediated between heavenly light and the world of man through a sophisticated language of patterns, reflections, and shadows. So we're about to hear more about this. Navina, thank you very much for coming. We're so honored. Over to you. Thank you so much for such a warm welcome to San Francisco. Um, I've been overwhelmed by the kindness and the hospitality that I've been shown here on this visit, and I want to say a very, very warm thanks to Sachi and especially to Kalpana to, for this very kind invitation. It's a great honor to be here on the 25th anniversary uh, and celebrate the great work that Sachi has been doing in this region for so long. I'd also like to thank uh, the Asian Art Museum, uh, the director, my colleague, Forrest McGill. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to be in this beautiful museum here today. I've been so inspired by the installations, by the didactics, by the experience of just being in these spaces with these wonderful objects. So thank you for that too and for your invitation today. So, um, <clears throat> I'm going to be sharing with you today the work that I have been doing on a forthcoming book which approaches the architectural history of India's Mughal age through the examination of a single exquisite feature, the carved and pierced Jali screen, which is to be found on so many of its monuments. Mughal buildings of the 16th and 17th centuries are filled with many spectacular features of ornament, including elaborate carving, inlay work, particularly the famed Parchinkari or Pietra Dura inlay seen in the Taj Mahal, wall painting, of which very little actually survives, relief carving, gilding, and these remarkable Jali screens. The consideration of the Jali, both within the context of Mughal architecture and ornament, as well as independent of it, allows us to explore the full artistic, expressive, and metaphorical potential of this feature and to take the study of Mughal architecture forward into a focus on its detail, understanding better how all the pieces of a Mughal edifice fit together, what kinds of workshops and craftsman skills were active in the making of this rich heritage, and who the brilliant patrons of these works were, so careful to oversee each detail to such excellence. The Mughal age dawned in South Asia in the early 16th century with the arrival of the Timurid prince Babur in 1526 and formally lasted for about 300 years until the Mughal empire was officially replaced uh, by British rule in 1857. Its cultural reach included almost all parts of the subcontinent from which artists, talents, styles, and materials were drawn to the Mughal court, which in turn both absorbed and diffused styles of art and architecture. The Mughal age produced a great diversity of artistic expression as a result, but was also unified in unmistakable stylistic idioms. And I'm using the term Mughal and Mughal world in the broadest possible sense, to include the centers, provinces, regions, and courts, including the Deccani and Rajput courts that were part of this vast multicultural empire. The Mughal style lasts in some ways until the present day and certainly seduced Doris Duke when she went to India for her honeymoon in 1935, commissioning, among other things, an exquisite set of jali carved windows for her Mughal suite in Shangri-La, Honolulu. 
Let us, though, approach the question of what is a Jali screen and how it works in a building through a mosque in Gujarat, which bears one of the most famous examples of this art. This building lies in the center of Ahmedabad city today and is known as the Siddhi Sayyid Mosque. As the title Siddhi implies, the patron of this mosque is thought to have been the Abyssinian nobleman Siddhi Sayyid, who died in 1576 and was a member of a powerful African slave nobility at court uh, and was in service of the Gujarat Sultanate during the reign of Sultan Mahmud III. The mosque was created at the very eve of Mughal annexation in 1572, perhaps explaining why parts of it seem to have been left incomplete. And when hints of Mughal-inspired naturalism in the art styles were beginning to be felt in the architectural decoration of the Gujarat Sultanate. Here we see the mosque structure as a worshipper would approach it, from beside the hose or the water tank for ablution. The mosque appears as a low-lying, flat-roofed building with five bays leading to the Qibla wall, which is oriented towards the holy city of Mecca for the devotee to offer his prayers. The low bastion on one side might once have held aloft a minaret for the muezzin to call the faithful five times daily for prayer, but today is lost or was possibly never completed. Through the colonnade, we glimpse a trace of filtered light coming through arched screens on the, uh, on the upper part of the Qibla wall. Coming closer still, an ethereal image comes into focus of an organic tracery seen in silhouette against the light which filters through its fine openings. It remains enigmatic and distant, but somehow transforms the inner space with lightness and fineness, fighting for its own against the bright calendars, green fans, and very loud carpet to be found there today. Moving to the back of the building, the plan becomes clearer. We see the Qibla wall from the outside with three protrusions or mehrabs, prayer niches, in the lower part, surmounted by a series of arched windows fitted with screens. Move closer still, and then the astonishing Tree of Life Jali comes into full view. Time stands still for one glorious instant when the eyes fully set upon the majestic vision of an opulent tree unfurling its branches in lyrical grace across a pierced surface bearing hundreds of delicate flowers and leaves which grow from it. A testament like almost no other to the Gujarati stonemasons whose mastery of carving, chiseling, drilling, and executing a complex design is patent here. Hidden behind this, uh, the curving tree is a straight and tall date palm tree, reinforcing the central axis against which the symmetrical and yet asymmetrical design expands. The main tree grows from a stylized ring vaguely resembling an open-mouthed spout issuing fronds, a motif often seen in Indian art, but here evoked at the base of this fantastical tree. Why not, when this exuberant growth clearly lies beyond the laws of the natural world, yet we can recognize familiar flowers and petals and shapes and forms? How can this powerful tree motif be interpreted in the context of mosque decoration, and especially in this exalted position on the Qibla wall itself. The symbol of a tree bears rich symbolism in, India, in Indo-Islamic culture, drawing references from texts and traditions. Islamic texts mention the tree, mention the tree of immortality, the Shajarat al-Khuld, which is sometimes associated with the biblical tree in the Garden of Eden. And the Quran mentions the Tuba tree, the blessed tree in paradise, which is a tree that is so big and huge that if a traveler were to travel in its shade for a hundred years, he would not cross it, and whose single grape would satisfy a whole tribe. In Indian tradition exists the wish-fulfilling tree, the Kalpa Vriksh, a symbol of nourishment that fulfills all needs. So this image seems to combine a rich reference to Indian and Islamic tradition, meaningful to a wide audience. 
A second incredible arch contains seven trees, seven alternating flowering trees with waving and bending palms, interwoven with vines and leafy fronds, forming a wall of nature that seems both impenetrable and embracing. These images of sculpture, imagination, and technique demand to be studied in their own right, from design and drawing to execution and meaning in the visual language of South Asian art. A third such jali must have been planned in the central bay of the mosque, but was never completed as the Mughals arrived. The relationship between such tree motifs extended into the world of textiles, particularly the development of the painted and dyed textiles, kalamkaris, sometimes known as palampos, of the Coromandel Coast, which came to develop a, a, a central fantastical tree motif um, executed in a sinuously carved manner and rising from a hillock. While many li missing links between the worlds of the Gujarat Sultanate and the Deccan remain to be traced, the visual evidence argues for a larger context of such fantastical tree motifs that extended across the arts and across geography. A great jali has the complexity of a Bach fugue, the mystery of frozen ether, and a level of master craftsmanship that the world has seldom seen. Stuart Carey Welch, circa 2000. But growing up in an Indian boarding school in the lower Himalayas, I had no idea really what a jali in this sense was. The term jali, which comes from the Sanskrit to mean net, was only ever heard by me to describe the wire mesh in our windows and doors designed to keep the mosquitoes out and the students in, locked into their dormitories. My appreciation of architectural jalis only came about when I was a student of art history at Oxford, and I met the late Stuart Carey Welch, who at the time was the head of the Department for Islamic and later Indian Art at Harvard University, an insightful art historian and also a writer with tremendous powers of expression. I am thus inspired to organize the discussion of jalis today through a series of quotes which bring out their essential spirit. I start with Carrie's own lines, which he penned to another mentor on the subject, Mitchell Abdul Karim Kreitz. Carrie chose his analogy with care. For the fugue is described as being a tool of supreme musical logic, which Bach ma mastered in blending a mathematical perfection of the art form with his own emotional realizations. One of the spaces, one of the Jali spaces I encountered early on was Carrie's own Jali Mehel, which he built in New Hampshire in the early 2000s. Here, a large room was kept spare and neat with his collection of outstanding Mughal Jalis installed in dramatic fashion against the windows. The red sandstone Jalis were set in pale wood supports, which matched the texture and clean lines of the simple furniture which Carrie had designed to go with them. You can see here a view of the room, together with a 16th century rearing bronze lion of the Akbar period on the table, one of many important works in the Welsh collection. In the lower picture, you see Carrie himself teaching us how a jali space is to be best enjoyed, <laughs> horizontally, with beautiful art objects, books, and music, a Mughal fantasy realized in our own time. Carrie attempted to design his own jalis from time to time, working closely with a Jaipur workshop where skilled craftsmen executed his inventive designs. He broke new ground on several occasions, including when he created this ecclesiastical jali, beautifully photographed by our photographer Abhinav Goswami, to catch the divine light as it touches the crisp edges of the crucifixes and highlights the contrast with the roughly shaped borders of the slab. The Manasa Silpa Shastra of the 4th century is one of several ancient Indian treatises on aesthetics. Among its many instructive passages is a recommendation for the treatment of windows and the motifs with which they should be carved. It mentions many motifs, 
assigning precise terms to each of them, and says that these are the shapes of the windows of which the naga and the vali should be employed in, te in temples. From this early period, not many freestanding temples in stone are known, so the instructions are likely to pertain to wood architecture, a great lost tradition of the subcontinent, but which can be gleaned from later stone features in the same style. This is evident from the great rock cut Chaitya Hall of the 2nd to the 1st century BC from Betsa in Maharashtra, where you can see many features resembling wooden elements, such as the plaited um, elements uh, around the arches and the ribs inside those arches. There would likely have been a huge wooden jali in the gap above the cave entrance, and it might have taken the sh shape of a relatively simple cross form as the pierced and drilled rock-cut jali here, upon which the sunshine is conveniently falling. The forms mentioned in the text can be seen in many medieval Hindu and Jain temples all across the region. They are designed to bring in the light to those dark spaces by piercing outer walls, and they hold an auspicious function. These motifs also appear as part of a grid called the so-called Sakandak arrangement, where many of them appear all together, creating a wall of motifs, each one often quite different from the next, but all brought together in this arrangement. However, this feature never became dominant in temples. It was always somewhat of a low-key element compared to the other features, such as sculpture or decorative relief carvings. With the arrival of Islam in Gujarat, new ideas about the metaphoric potential of light, aesthetics from western part of Asia, and the need for new types of interior spaces, such as the maksura, or private space within the mosque for the use of women or the nobility, brought about a transformation in the jali. This relatively low-key feature of the temples was adapted and transformed into a much more significant element in mosques. And this is evident in the mosque of Hilal Khan, built in the area of Dholka in 1333, one of the earliest structures to adapt this feature to new importance. The upper story of this building is fitted with a grand jali. The sacred symbols of the temples are all embraced with the addition of a single line of mehrab niches in the upper register. Some of the motifs in Gujarat jalis find close parallels in motifs found in large dyed and printed textile produced in the region and which form one of the most widely traded forms of textiles found from Fustat in Egypt to Indonesia, and which are generally dated to the 14th century. The so-called big leaf style textiles, uh, and this big leaf style textile contains a distinctive trefoil-shaped floral form, which resembles the motif in the Jali screen from Ahmedabad, in a Jali screen from Ahmedabad, I hope you can see. Um, I don't have a pointer, but I think you can see it. Um, and also the border frames contain similar spiky floral heads contained in roundels at the cross points. Now, while this formula of sacred symbols enclosed in square grids proliferated in the Gujarati buildings, in Mughal patronage, it met its apogee in the tomb of the famous saint Muhammad Ghos in Gwalior. Muhammad Ghos was born in Gwalior in, in about 1500, and together with his brother, Sheikh Pool, uh, he was a prominent, they were prominent figures from the school of Shattari Sufism at the court of the Mughal emperor Humayu, the son of Babur. Humayu was believed to be superstitious, perhaps to a fault, but deeply interested in the question of how the cosmic sphere and planets affected his courtly affairs. The Shatari brothers were accused by their critics of having an untoward effect on the emperor and of introducing occult practices to court. But Muhammad Ghos was much more than just another courtier struggling for favor. He was an early builder of bridges in the Mughal world, translating important philosophical treatises from Sanskrit into Persian at the court and composing others. Among them, is his translation of a lost text, the Amrit Kund, the Pool of Nectar, translated into Persian as the Bahre Hayat, the Ocean of Life, 
which introduced Sufi to Sufism a set of yogic practices, shown here in a later 17th century copy of the manuscript made for Humayun's grandson, Jahangir. And you can see from these illustrations that the figures are actually uh, practicing different asanas of yoga. At Ghos's death in 1562, an edifice to the saint was erected in Gwalior, which remains a major pilgrimage site for people of all faiths in India. Like all shrines, they tie their niyat strings or hopes and wishes to the jali screens. The building is enveloped in tall jalis, filling the space with an ethereal dappled light that changes through the days and through the seasons. The patterns of the screens incorporate the sacred symbols of ancient Indian temples in the square grid formula that we have seen, an appropriate formula for the yogic philosophy of the saint. But there are <clears throat> also new types of jalis, including a, a type of articulated vine in a stiff yet lively form. Um, and you can see that you can see that somewhat in, in the central panel up above. It's not all sort of symbols and square grids. You're beginning to see this kind of naturalistic vine appear. Um, and in another area, we see a reciprocal vine pattern, um, meaning the same sort of design up and down. It was therefore a poignant discovery when far from the grandeur of the Gwalior tomb, we discovered the remote tomb of his brother, Sheikh Pool, and its brotherly bond of a single band of openwork ca carving in the same reciprocal design of the Muhammad Ghaz Jali, which you can see just that lone little uh, band up above. No. I swear by the stars that recede, shifting and setting, by the night when it departs, by the morning when it breathes. The Quran, Surah 81, verses 15 to 18. The Islamic faith brought a new symbolism of the meaning of light. Not only is the Quran replete with celestial imagery, such as the beautiful quote here, but it also contains one of the most famous verses, the so-called light verse, the Surat An-Nur, which speaks of God as light. This idea of a divine light is reflected in many works of art from the world of Islam, including the production of items related to lamps and actual physical light. You can see this as aesthetic in many of these early objects where surfaces were pierced, and these are examples of mosque lamps uh, and, and daily lamps, which show that feature. Uh, one of the pieces closer to, closer to me is a simple earthenware uh, lamp that was excavated at Nishapur, um, sort of medieval town in, in Iran. And further away from me is the use of sheet metal, um, including which, which is pierced and includes calligraphy, out of which a light would have been th um, you know, thrown, dappled um, effects all around. A language of celestial mathematics accompanies the designs and patterns that enter the northern sultanates in India from the 13th century, most especially seen in the powerful Jali streams of the Alai Darwaza, one of the four gates entering the Qutub Minar complex in Delhi that were erected in 1312. Here we see a completely different design from the native square grids, a geometric design of stars and hexagons that creates illusions of other shapes and medallions carved in articulated ridges. You can see that more clearly here. And if you meditate on these shapes, they really begin to change, and you're not really sure anymore whether you're looking at stars, hexagons, or greater medallions. Um, there's a kind of mysterious quality to the way these, these shapes actually, and patterns, evolve in, in, while you look at them. Mughal art abounded in heavenly illusion, adopting both solar and lunar imagery and developing a sophisticated language of symbolism in the art and courtly pageant pageantry. Um, a famous allegorical picture of Jahangir shows him seated on a throne fashioned as an hourglass as he is surrounded by figures from different worlds. Jahangir is enveloped in a double halo that incorporates the light of both the sun and the crescent moon. But for the Mughal imagination, Light may not only have been bright white, but red, as was given the name to the luminous red spinels of which Jahangir was so fond. Jahangir's most famous queen, Nur Jahan, 
or light of the world, like her husband, had the word Noor applied to her name, or the word for light. Together, the king and queen used this term to signify coinage and various aspects of courtly ritual. Noor Jahan's father, Mirza Riyaz Beg, was an Iranian expat uh, working for her husband. He was the vizier at the court and was given the title of Itmad al or Pillar of the State. And he is shown here in this painting with Jahangir, the emperor. Uh, Noor Jahan, who was an active patron of the arts and a great tastemaker in the period, built a small and beautiful mausoleum for her father and her mother, Azmat Begum, completed in 1628, which is known as the Baby Taj, particularly for its Pietra Dura inlay work. So here we have um, an image of the tomb as it stands today in Agra. And it's a delightful, small um, jewel box of a, of a site. As you get closer to it, Everywhere you walk past, you just see these incredible Jali screens, which uh, I must say, I mean, the tomb has been appreciated for all of its remarkable features, but the Jalis, I think until our study, have been waiting for the appreciation. Just to create a screen like that, you had to extract so much stone and leave what was left in this perfect balance so that it would not collapse. It was strong and, and light at the same time. So it's an absolute marvel of, of um, carving again. We, in the course of our study, had access to the upper level of the tomb, which is now very hard to see. Um, and we were allowed to go up there with our photographer to really um, look at this very special space that had been built on the very top level of the tomb. What's interesting about these Mughal tombs is that they usually have three layers. They have the actual graves and the bodies, the burial sites in the crypt right below the monument. Then on the first floor, the ground floor, they have a kind of a cenotaph arrangement which is visited by the public. Um, and then right on the top, they have a kind of third, third level marking uh, in a kind of vertical axis the position of the, of the graves down below. And this place is the most inaccessible. It's not really there for the public. We imagine that maybe the family and very special visitors were allowed to go up there and pay their respects. Um, but we were allowed up there, thanks to the government of Uttar Pradesh, after, much, um, after many letters of permission were uh, you know, requested. And when we got up there with our photographer, we beheld this beautiful little pavilion right on the top, which is completely uh, surrounded by these pierced walls. And when you enter the space, it's quite breathtaking to see the light coming in through uh, onto the floor, which is adorned with this spectacular inlaid arabesque, and the tombs or the grave markers of the parents are in the middle of this space. Um, each wall is a delight to look at because, of course, all the ornament works together. So you're looking at the beautiful inlay work, the symbol of the cypress tree surrounded by a flowering pl a plant, which is often a symbol of the lover and the beloved, um, little vignettes of paradise, fruits and, and wonderful things that will be offered to them in heaven. And then the heavenly light itself streaming through this filtered uh, meshwork and falling on the graves. Um, this is one of my personal phot favorite photographs that, we, uh, that the photographer took because it is just such a subtle idea that was captured, this idea of the dappled light on the graves themselves. So... Um, so that's, that's the tomb of Itema the Dollar. Latticed windows of white marble, which are really very pleasing to the eye. The Padsha Nama of Juarez in 1648. It was in the architecture of Shah Jahan that a new Jali revolution took place. When the Jali screen abandoned the celestial order for paradisical illusion, Shah Jahan is considered to be the most inspired and active builder among the Mughal emperors, leaving a legacy of incredible architecture. As a new vision of paradise on earth evolved, the features of his building came to reflect a new emphasis on floral forms, from relief carvings to ja carved jalis, while staying true to the symmetrical approach and the geometric principles that had been established. Here, for example, 
we see a symmetrical, uh, we, we see a view out from the palace section of the bastion and the Agra fort, which frames nature and the world beyond in tall and lacy jalis of stylized vines set filtering the lights and the views. Even stripped of all the furnishings and the other decorations, we can appreciate the aesthetics of the space. Shah Jahan's most famous project, the Taj Mahal complex, tomb complex, built for his beloved wife, Mumtaz Mahal, was completed in 1653. Built on the banks of the uh, Jamuna River, the complex is set in a Persian garden and includes a mosque and a pendant building on each side. The tomb itself is laid out in an eightfold plan of the Hasht Behisht, or the eight heavens, and its white marble walls are inlaid with Quranic verses and semi-precious stones to create a vision of a celestial garden. Surrounding the central cenotaph, where the queen and later the emperor were laid to rest, is an octagonal jali wall with vines, flowers, and tendrils, creating an organic web around the grave markers. And this is really quite an incredible um, wall. Uh, again, in the course of our research, we discovered that the original wall that was designed and built by one of the great luminaries at the court, uh, his name was Saida Gilani, and he came from Gilan in, in Iran. And he was a polymath, a wizard who could compose poetry, do enameling, cut into, um, cut into jade. I think perhaps even that beautiful jade bowl in your galleries here could have been handled by Saida Gilani. Um, this, uh, this talent, originally designed golden uh, jalis in solid gold to go around the central cenotaph, which were then later replaced by um, marble jalis. So we have, incredible as these are, we might have actually been deprived of something even more incredible at the time had we been, back, been there back in those days. Um, <clears throat> Jali covers of the Shah Jahan period surpassed themselves once again in the Moti Masjid, or the Pearl Mosque, built a little later at Agra. This mosque contains several Jali screens whose designs incorporate Italianate motifs and whose interlocked forms convey an incredible tensile energy. And again, this is a tribute to our photographer on this project because he waited all day for the light to fall on the jali just at the right angle so that you can really sense that energy, that sense of stress uh, that builds up this design. The European elements in Shah Jahani jalis include this spectacular style where an entire flowering vase is created. And I have a close-up picture to show you. Um, and of course, because of the Mughal um, great commitment to naturalism, the, the, uh, the uh, leaves actually bend and curve in an almost three-dimensional naturalistic way. But in, incredibly, it is completely pierced and cut through. Um, and then in yet another variation of the floral jali style, we see whole flowers carved in the open and set into a monumental jali screen at the tomb complex, uh, complex of Ghaziuddin in the late 17th century. I am searching for my beloved who has hidden herself behind the thin curtain of eyelashes. Sultan Ibrahim Adil Shah II, 17th century. Ibrahim Adil Shah, the mystically inclined ruler of the Bijapur court in the Deccan, imaginatively describes eyelashes in his beloved's modestly lowered gaze as a kind of veil behind which she hides. The Deccan Sultanates have long been credited with having a unique artistic imagination infused with connections to the Middle East and Europe, and underpinned by powerful Sufi and Shia traditions of the courts. Central to the artistic identity of the Deccan was Ibrahim, who composed a book of music, the kitab e Ras, and patronized some of the most talented artists. At his death, his tomb, erected by his wife, and also associated with African patronage, the nobleman Malik Sandal, displays a rich epigraphic program which extends to the Jalis, which introduced a style unique to the Deccan. You can see one here. Originally, there were 12 such Jalis, but only two survive. 
Above the doorway into the tomb, we see an archway fitted with pierced calligraphy, quoting verses from the Quran. This tour de force of carving is truly remarkable and very different from anything else that was ever attempted in Mughal buildings. Uh, and one of the little secrets that we discovered is that this calligraph calligraphic inscription is actually readable from the inside backwards in one small section. You have to be a very, very talented epigraphist to be able to figure out how that works. But it's, it's a kind of incredible design that was executed um, by incredible craftsmen. The unique approach of the Deccan to architectural jalis is also seen in the Paiga tombs at Hyderabad, created in the 18th and 19th centuries for members of the influential nobility of the court. Here, gracious spaces are adorned with stucco jalis, carved as both pierced and closed styles in a dazzling display of geometric form. I know the planets talk at night and tell secrets about you. Mirabai, 16th century. But what of the world of women behind the jolly screens and charokas of Rajput palaces? While these screens had the desired effect of segregating the, the sexes, in the artistic imagination, Jali screens also sparked a sense of mystery and allure for what lay beyond. Life behind the Jali screen became a point of fascination, partly because it was the most powerful and inaccessible women who were concealed from gaze. The desert forts and palaces of Rajasthan are famed for their Jali work, where lengthy facades are covered with intricately carved screens that are integrated alongside um, alongside dense carving and other forms of ornament. Typical of the Rajput style was the combination of a deeply curving Bangla Eve style roof or cusped arch uh, or cusped arches sur surmounting the Jali screen. From this cloistered world, the voices of women writers and poets such as Mirabai and Vishnu Priya and so many others emerged to tell us of their personal, social and spiritual concerns as a powerful body of literature that offers us a view into a world that is screened from our eyes. As modernity approaches, perhaps they sat on a jali bench like this one to contemplate the coming tide. And of course, if you're a Jali hunter like we were, we found Jalis in all kinds of places, including uh, in this outdoor site where this um, whimsical bench still remains. But now, alas, we come to our modern times. You know the reason I love the stars? is because we can't hurt them, we can't burn them, we can't melt them, we can't make them overflow, we can't flood them or blow them up, so we keep reaching for them. Laurie Anderson, 2010. The modern era has witnessed the reinvigoration of the Jali form in the hands of a new generation of artists, architects and designers. The metaphoric potential of stars and solar symbols, silhouette, shadow, geometric pattern, and light reflect the ideas of individual creators, often in response, in anguished response, to a world besieged with social, environmental, and political challenges. <clears throat> Modern art movements have liberated the Jali from architectural settings and allowed artists to reinterpret it as a freestyle of creative expression. Grid or geometric forms are used by the London-based British-Palestinian artist Mona Hatoum, born 1952 in Beirut, to reference systems of control within society. Hatoum's dramatic installation, Light Sentence, created in 1992 out of stacked wire mesh, <clears throat> uh, out of stacked wire mesh lockers illuminated by a slow-moving motorized light bulb casts shadows of harsh and unsettling memory rooted in personal ba battles with, re with disorientation, displacement, and identity. Here, the jali has become a cage, 
and the light appears as a spirit trapped within. An almost opposite effect, one of contemplation and contemplativeness, was seen in a 2013 installation, Intersections, by Pakistani-American artist Anila Kayum Ara. A single light bulb inside a large suspended metal cube, laser-cut with geometry inspired from the Alhambra, bathes the walls, ceilings, and floors of the chamber with waves of interlacing pattern, enveloping all who enter this transcendental space. But the experience of exile and themes of social justice are also explored by Afruz Amiri, born 1974 in Tehran, a US-based sculptor and installation artist. Still Garden, created in 2011, is formed by the projection of light through a hand-cut sheet of woven polythene, the same material used to construct refugee tents. Amigi uses vegetal and geometric patterns and also integrates references to Persian painting to present a nuanced commentary on the Middle East and its current affairs. If we think of the great buildings that we've seen in the 20th and 21st century that use the idea of a jali, a pierced screen, uh, we must turn to the work of the French architect Jean Nouvel, who has designed two exceptional buildings um, closer to me, uh, sorry, further away from me is the, uh, the open work Metallic Jali uh, that is in the Institut du Monde Arabe in Paris. Um, and closer to me is the incredible roof, um, which is an eight-layered roof, um, pierced roof in the new um, Louvre in Abu Dhabi, um, which uh, was a kind of revelation to learn about, uh, engineered with computer algorithms to create um, a kind of set of cuts into the surface so that the sunlight would always be moving as a kind of rain, rain of light uh, throughout the spaces below. Um, so these were some of the exciting projects that I discovered along the way um, of, of contemporary architects working with this medium. Um, but I'd like to end on my favorite jali, um, or one of my favorite jalis. It's hard to choose one, but this one is very special. Um, the photographer on the project that I mentioned, his name is Abhinav Goswami. He is, in fact, a trained temple priest, uh, trained in the bhakti uh, rituals of uh, the Braj region, where his family has long held responsibilities in a temple uh, in the, in the Sri Radha Raman temple in Vrindavan. Um, and he was able to take this photograph of a very special ritual that happens only during the period of seva, or service of the god and the goddess. In this ritual, a fresh jali of jasmine buds is created every day. And so the jali screen that you see is made of fragrant, fresh jasmine buds. And it is against this uh, jali screen that the little images of Radha and Krishna are, are placed and against which the worship takes place. And so to me, this is the rarest jali because it lasts for such a short time. It's the most uh, fragrant jali, of course, because it's made of these buds. And it's also maybe the most precious because it speaks to a value that we humans um, must always struggle to preserve, which is that of unity, of coming together, um, and I think there's no better way to see that when you see Radha and Krishna sit, see, uh, placed in front of a Mughal Jali. Um, so thank you very much. Well, thank you so much. This has been so inspiring, uh, light, especially this time of year. Um, it's uh, very sensitive as it's going down. It made me sort of think anew about uh, what we're now experiencing. And I'm sitting here, and we'll look. We're in a room of jollies. Oh. <laughs> it, it was, it's just amazing. It was a very enlightening, very beautiful talk. Thank you so much. 
And um, Dr. Haider has uh, agreed that she will answer just a, a couple of questions. So if you have, anybody has any questions, anything? Um, oh, we're, we're all, oh, wait, there's one over here. Let's step aside. Both Lee and I are, are sitting here looking at the, uh, the little fresh white jasmine and um, supposedly this jolly is constructed of them or in the pattern of them? Um, the, the, the jasmine. Yes. That's, so, yes. So I've just put a little picture of a jasmine bud in the green circle right, down right. below. But the entire thing is stitched. The white net that you see is created by stitching those little flower heads together to create this jolly screen. Stitchy, yeah, it's okay, it's oh, really right. incredible. It's incredible, yeah. But do you want stitching them together? Well, the I, you know, it lasts a day at least, so it, in, in a, it depends on the ritual. But there's a 13 day ritual where it's changed every day. How many individuals, are <laughs> How many individuals are man hours? I I don't know. Um, these rituals are not sort of easily accessed, but accessible to, by people, you know, outside the kind of circle. But, um, you know, it's an act of devotion to create this. So it's, you know, I don't think they, they consider the time well spent. Um, and, you know, it's sort of, <laughs> it's part of the whole devotional act. The, the visual effects are just stunning. How much of your work uh, found anything out about ventilation? So the light obviously was one major aspect or maybe the only aspect was, was ventilation important too? Yes, very much so. The ventilation is, is very important and it's actually being brought back now by new age architects who want to sort of see this as an um, uh, ecologically sensitive way of actually cooling building spaces. In the book, we do have a section on that. Uh, and we actually look at the work of an American architect named Laurie Baker, who did a lot of architecture in South India. He, he was very interested in creating a brickwork skin around buildings, a pierced brickwork skin, as a way to ventilate the building. And so you can actually go to these buildings and we, we studied them a little bit and included them in the book. Can you uh, tell us a little bit more about the craftsmen themselves, what tools they use? Where were they from? What was their training? So this is a funny thing is that, you know, we actually, these craftsmen, like so many craftsmen in India and other parts of the world where the individual isn't sort of known, they're more or less lost to history. And we actually don't know very much about their techniques either. It's very, uh, it was very tempting to interview contemporary craftsmen, talk to them, understand what they think they, they were doing. But I've worked quite a lot with craftsmen in Morocco and in India and other places to know that even, I mean, very respectfully, even though they think they are doing something exactly as they, it was done back in the day, in fact, so many changes and evolutions have taken place. So we cannot confidently say what were the materials, what were the methods, who were the people, what were the techniques. Honestly, we can't really say. And so in the book, I, we do acknowledge this gap in our knowledge. We also say that it may be a mystery that would never be solved. Um, when we were designing the Moroccan court at the Met, for example, we had a kind of battle, a showdown between the, our colleagues with their computer system called the CAD design you know, program versus the craftsman who came from Morocco. And the craftsman uh -huh. had, <laughs> had a single instrument, which was a divider. And based on the single divider, they would measure the entire space and work out the entire decorative program to perfection. Meanwhile, the, 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 the designer was sort of armed with his computer and, you know, would be trying his best, actually, to figure out how they got the arch without, you know, doing it the way he would. And he couldn't really. They were kind of two different languages. Um, slightly mysterious gap between the way we approach these things and what we think we see. Could you give us an example of how do you do this research? And how do you set about it? And what are some of the challenges? How do you overcome those? 
Uh, <clears throat> well, I mean, we do a lot of field visits. We read a lot of the scholarship on these mm -hmm. works and uh, and these places. Um, there's a great body of literature. People have written about architecture, Mughal buildings, especially the British period, the colonial period. They did tremendous drawings. Um, so, you know, we, we have to read all the literature. We have to make a lot of field visits. We have to read the work of our colleagues and then decide whether we agree or not, because it's very important to read work critically and, and to, to have an independent opinion. And when you don't know what you're doing, you don't quite know how to judge it. So you give it lots of time before you, you create a critical framework for yourself and how to think about these things. And then eventually, I think you w wait for a touch of inspiration. I think that's very important um, when you're doing this kind of study because it is actually quite tough. Um, and for each of us involved in this project in different ways, we each needed to find our inspiration. I think for our, for our photographer who's based in the region, um, he's a real explorer by, by nature, so he loved just being out in the field. Um, and I, uh, you know, sort of interacted with a lot of scholars. So th that's all part of the process. Um, but I have to confess, I'm not an architectural, uh, I'm not an architecture specialist. So I'm approaching the world of architecture in a slightly different way, as you can see. I'm looking at it more aesthetically uh, and more through a kind of single focus on a single feature. Is it on? Yeah. Just, just one question. How much do we know or do you know about the actual craftsman and how individualistic is it a work? Are there specific masters and specific schools or is it more traditions that anonymize uh, people a little bit like what we see in um, European art in cathedrals or things like that? Um, so the, we don't know a lot about the craftsman. This is a piece of missing information. We do know that there were ustads or master craftsmen who we sometimes their names emerge in history or they emerge in records. In the case of the particular Jali carving workshops, we think that there were workshops that specialized in this kind of training and this kind of production, but we don't know who the individuals were. We have to say, though, when it comes to the idea of the individual, that is also something that has to be factored in as, as something that means something different in each society and at each point. The idea of the individual, in some sense in the, in the European tradition, is a Renaissance value to something that was fought very hard for. Um, and, but in, in non-Western societies, the individual still hasn't, in many contexts, emerged at all. So. Um, you know, from uh, historical records to the present moment, many individuals are missing in history. Well, I think there's just one more. Well, there's one more. Okay, this is Hello. the okay. This is the last question. Hello. Did, had you thought about the connections between pendant lamps in mosques with their pierced uh, metallic exteriors? Or yeah. Yes, yes, very much so. That's what, well, we, I showed a couple of the, the lamps, um, and I was really inspired by a couple of studies that I read. Uh, really interesting work being done on the optics, the optical effects uh, in early mosque spaces, um, because these, these spaces were often kind of, you know, they were dark, they, the lamps had a tremendous... Um, impact, they were also hung, not just a single lamp, sometimes with multiples, and positioned in a certain way so that the optics, opticals would work in a, in a certain way. So it was actually a very high um, art, kind of calculated to perfection. Um, and then the piercings um, must in some ways be analogs to the kind of work that we see in evolving from Jali screens. Thank you so much.